Well, hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 236 of Stand Up. Joining me today is award-winning journalist, best-selling author, and all-around amazing human being, Celeste Headley, for the hour. My name is Pete Dominic. It's time to stand up with me right now. Well, hello, my friends. I hope you had a good weekend. I hope you got outside. Share your pictures, your nature pictures with me as always. You know, I say that from time to time here on the show, and so many of you either share them with me on Twitter or you email them to me. I'm at Pete Dominic on Twitter. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com on the email. And I love it. I love, love, love it when you send me your pictures from nature. And I hope that my asking for them encourages you to get outside, if that's not already, of course a part of your regular daily routine. Oh, nature's nectar. Had a great time this weekend being outside, fiddling around, cleaning up the yard still from after building the shed studio. It's still a mess out there, and I'm getting very close to being done and feeling great about it. I had a little bonfire or two to weigh the stumps because I'm moving the garden from one side of the house to the other side. That's my mini project, and I am enjoying it thoroughly. Send me your nature pictures Send them along, your projects, whatever you're doing, your problems. Join the Facebook Garden Group if you haven't already, if you're on Facebook. If you're not, you're a better human being. But the Stand Up Garden Club has got almost a 1,000 members on it. And we have almost 800 subscribers to the show now. So if you haven't subscribed yet to this show to be a part of our community as well, please sign up for a paid subscription because while the show is free, it isn't cheap. I put a lot of work into it each and every day with my great network of guests that join me and have these fascinating conversations where we all learn together and share what we've learned. Tell me who you want to hear and what you want us to talk about. Email me anytime. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. Big crisis at my place over the weekend. We have a mouse infestation and my wife and all Italians that I know are terrified and hate mice. They're filthy. They're dirty. They're disease carriers. I get it. But I grew up in the country and we had a cat, so we didn't ever really have too much of a mouse problem. But We caught mice in the traps, and I catch them here, as I did in my New York City apartment, and as much as I hate them, I am going to get them all, but it's definitely a problem because there are eight dead mice already in just about 72 hours, and my wife is traumatized by it. She hates it. She's the toughest woman I know, but boy, does she hate mice, and here is the secret. Put little cotton swabs in the peanut butter, and always use peanut butter On your mouse traps. That's what I learned after about an hour and a half of YouTube research. And now I am the mouse hunter committing a mouse genocide. I will do whatever it takes to free my wife of this uh, minor worry. But to her, it's a big deal. And if you have any advice, any ideas, by all means, send them my way. But that's our, our little crisis over the weekend. Wanted to share that with you before we get to the big crises of the world. And that means, by the way, things are going pretty good. Val and I and the girls are doing pretty well as we start to uh, quarantine and shelter in place over the next couple of months. The numbers in New York are still seemingly pretty low, and that's fantastic news for New York and New Yorkers. But watching very closely on the alert app to make sure that they don't go up, our daughters are still hanging out with their friends a little bit. We're not really seeing anybody, although Val and I did go out to dinner on Saturday night. I'm not sure that we'll be doing that again anytime soon. So here we are, Thanksgiving week. I hope you're not traveling. There's supposed to be 50 million people traveling this week. Is that right? 83,000 Americans are hospitalized with COVID-19 and people are going to travel this week. The CDC is warning against travel, but it seems like a lot of people are ignoring it. Is that you? Are you traveling? Are you in your car on your way to grandmother's house right now? Let me know if you're traveling, if you're staying home, and what your Thanksgiving plans are. I'm not here to shame you. If you want to take the risk, everybody is on a spectrum, and I don't think it's too helpful when we're constantly shaming each other for every choice that we're making each and every day. Some of us are more responsible, quote, than others exposing ourselves in one way or another or not. But I'm not here to shame you. I do want to have a conversation about how you're handling it, as always. But wear a mask and socially distance, for God's sake. Let's get to some sound before I get to my guest, shall we? I always like to play a few clips for you here in the opening of the show, catch you up with a few things you probably want to know. The Sunday shows were all packed with 
fantastic guests. And let me start just uh, by playing, I think, from Friday, President Trump in a brief press conference. We haven't seen much since he lost, came out and touted how great he's done with bringing down pharmaceutical drug prices. And he then mentioned that, of course, he did win the election. Listen to this. Millions of dollars of negative advertisements against me during the campaign, which I won, by the way. But, you know, we'll find that out. Which I won, by the way. But, uh, you know, we'll find that out. Well, we won't find it out because President Trump is now like zero for 36 in his lawsuits, I think. Or there's, he, he won something in one of the lawsuits, but it wasn't of any significance whatsoever. There has been no fraud, no widespread fraud, hardly any fraud at all, apparently. And one of his crazy lawyers, Sidney Powell, just became too crazy for Trump on Sunday night after being criticized all day. This woman who had given some wild and crazy interviews to conservative outlets. She uh, apparently now is no longer a part of the team. The Trump campaign put out a statement Sunday night around 6 p.m. that read. Sidney Powell is practicing law on her own. She's not a member of the Trump legal team. She is not a lawyer for the president in his personal capacity. That is a statement from Rudy Giuliani, who is attorney for President Trump, as well as Jenna Ellis. They both had their names on that statement from the Trump Pence campaign as a senior legal advisors for President Trump. So he's still got Jenna Ellis and Rudy Giuliani But Sidney Powell, who has been at the press conferences with the other two, has also appeared on TV on behalf of the Trump campaign. Apparently, she got too crazy for them. Anyway, uh, conservatives and right wing talkers uh, are starting to peel away from the president and tell him the truth about what reality is that he lost by. I think it's almost up to seven million votes at this point. And he's not still not hearing it and probably never will admit that he lost. But I think it's worth Hearing some context, George Stephanopoulos had Chris Christie on ABC's This Week, where he is a contributor, and I thought this was a pretty important exchange with one of Trump's confidants. Uh, You could consider him, I guess, a Northeastern moderate, even though he's been in all kinds of trouble and I think is extreme in many ways. Nonetheless, here is Republican number one. Chris Christie with George Stephanopoulos on ABC's This Week. President Trump's speech on uh, early Wednesday morning, the day after the election, you said it's incumbent on him to come forward with the evidence. There have now been 34 court cases the president has lost. We saw Pennsylvania last night. We saw Pat Pat Toomey, the senator from Pennsylvania, say it's time for the president to enable this transition. It's time for the president to concede. The president's response was to attack Pat Toomey on Twitter. Is it finally time for this to end? Yes. And and here's the reason why. The president has had an opportunity to access the courts. And I said to you, you know, George, starting at 2.30 a.m. on Wednesday morning, if you've got the evidence of fraud presented. And what's happened here is, quite frankly, the conduct of the president's legal team has been a national embarrassment. Ooh. Sidney Powell accusing Governor Brian Kemp of a crime on television, yet being unwilling to go on TV um, and defend and lay out the evidence that she supposedly has. Um, This is outrageous conduct by any lawyer. And notice, George, they won't do it inside the courtroom. They allege fraud outside the courtroom, but when they go inside the courtroom, they don't plead fraud and they don't argue fraud. This is what I was concerned about at 2.30 in the morning on Wednesday night. Listen, I've been a supporter of the president's. I voted for him twice. But elections have consequences, and we cannot continue to act as if something happened here that didn't happen. You have an obligation to present the evidence. The evidence has not been presented, and you must conclude, as Tucker Carlson even concluded the other night, that if you're unwilling to come forward and present the evidence, it must mean the evidence doesn't exist. That's what I was concerned about starting on election night, and I remain concerned today. I think it's wrong. I think what you've heard, lots of Republicans starting to say this. I said it on election night, and I hope more say it going forward because um, the country is what has to matter the most. As much as I'm a strong Republican and I love my party, it's the country that has to come first. 
Oh, Chris Christie with some diplomacy. It's the country that has to come first. And that is Republican number one. And of course, uh, I've got more here. John Poderhertz coming up. He's a New York Post columnist. And but Sidney Powell on Sunday night is apparently no longer, as I mentioned, the Trump campaign statement, no longer on the team. But just a few days ago, eight days ago, Trump said, Sidney Powell's on the team. Three days ago, the official GOP account elevated her conspiracy theories. And today they disavow Sidney Powell altogether. An absolute train wreck, garbage fire, even by Trump standards. It's just been such an absolute disaster, this failed coup. And now here is New York Post columnist and pretty far right winger, but apparently not far enough. John Potterhertz of the New York Post on NBC's Meet the Press Sunday. What is happening to the messaging to the to the to the right side of the aisle in this country? Uh, It's very hard to fathom. Uh, Look, I'm a conservative. I got into this fight 40 years ago about smaller government and lower taxes and traditionalist values and a strong military. And that 40 years later, I and people like me are being put in the position of being accused of disloyalty because we do not buy into the notion that from his grave seven years ago, Hugo Chavez paid off the governor of Georgia, the Republican governor of Georgia, in a pay or play scheme to fix voting machines whose results were just Uh, verified by a hand recount that we are somehow being put in the position of having to say uh, it's okay that this go on this way uh, because uh, the president has every legal right to contest and we don't really have certification. Like this is where you get off the train uh, when you are asked to take the train to crazy town and then move to crazy town and send nuclear missiles to strike normal town. Oh, oh, this, John, this is when you get off the train now, not over the absolute insanity of every day of the last four years. Do you remember where you were after the election of 2016, that November, that dark November when Donald Trump was the president elect? Oof, I feel so much better than I did four years ago. And yet it's hard to imagine, as Jim Shuto at CNN tweeted a more damaging foreign disinformation operation than the one the president and his allies are waging right now against the U.S. presidential election. You couldn't have a foreign disinformation operation that would do more damage and divide Americans more effectively than what Donald Trump is doing to us right now. I thought that was a really interesting tweet by Jim Shuto. And then speaking of the fact that the president is just wrapped up and trying to find some kind of conspiracy that he can convince the American public occurred instead of worrying about the fact that we are in the worst situation with COVID-19 than we've been since it began. Mike Jollett tweeted hundreds of thousands of people are going to die in the dark this winter because Republicans want to hold on to power. And my friend Dan McDonald uh, quoted that it sounds hyperbolic, but it's a hundred percent accurate. Yeah. They're more worried about trying to hold on to power And almost very few Republicans in Congress in the Senate have shown any kind of backbone or spine. They're still afraid of Donald Trump, even though he is clearly the 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 big loser, the big loser. But yeah, I mean, they're still clinging to this power and not working to defeat this internal threat, which is killing Americans thousands by the day of COVID-19. And speaking of COVID-19, Dr. Anthony Fauci was making the rounds on the Sunday shows as shows as well. And here he is on CBS's Face the Nation with Margaret Brennan, who did a good job channeling the anger, fear and frustration of the American public having to sit out on the holidays. C is specifically saying you should only have people gathered for Thanksgiving who have been living inside your home, actively living there for 14 right. days. That means no neighbors. That means no travelers. That means your kid coming home right. from college shouldn't be in the room with you. I mean, is, does that advice expire after Thanksgiving? Is Christmas canceled too? 
Yeah. No, we don't know what's going to happen. And it could actually, if we don't do this correctly and pay close attention to the reality of what's possible if we ignore these recommendations, that you could continue to have that exponential increase as you get into Christmas. And that's one of the things we're concerned about. It's a natural reaction to say, now, wait a minute, I know these people, you know, they're friends, they're coming in. You tend to almost intuitively and instinctively let you, let your guard down. Now, you don't want to say that no one can come in, but you could have people that have their own pods of protection, mm -hmm. people who might quarantine themselves, who might get a test. But in general, what I would recommend, and I, and I do this every day, Margaret, is to tell families to just take a moment to do what I call a risk-benefit determination. If I have someone in my home who's elderly, someone who has an underlying condition, do I really want to put that person at risk from someone who mm -hmm. innocently or inadvertently could infect them? Because we know clearly that people who don't have symptoms are clearly capable and are yeah. transmitting the infection. So just think about it for a moment, the risk now versus the long range of what you can do if you continue to be healthy. You heard it from Dr. Anthony Fauci. Always great advice from that guy who is an American hero. I hope hope people agree with that. I mean, a lot of people, of course, uh, want him uh, dead and don't trust him. And Steve Bannon wanted to cut his head off. But other than that, I think like the vast majority of Americans overwhelmingly trust Anthony Fauci. And another doctor that a lot of people trust is the chief of Operation Warp Speed, Dr. Monsef Slawi. He was also making the rounds on the Sunday shows. Here he is in an interview on Sunday with CNN's Jake Tapper, where he was asked when the first American would be vaccinated and when will life return to normal? I definitely wanted to share this with you as well. Pfizer submitted its emergency use authorization application for its vaccine on Friday. An FDA vaccine advisory committee is slated to meet December 10th. This appears to be an extraordinary achievement. When do you expect the first person will be vaccinated? Well, our plan is to be able to ship vaccines to the immunization sites within 24 hours from the approval. So I would expect maybe on day two after approval, on the 11th or on the 12th of December, hopefully uh, the first people will be immunized across the United States, across all states, uh, in all the areas where the, the state departments of health will have to, told us where to deliver the vaccines. And you've said you, you plan to vaccinate 20 million people in the month of December in the United States and up to another 30 million per month after that. How many Americans need to be vaccinated for life to be able to return to normal? And, and when might that happen? So normally with the level of efficacy we have, 95 percent, 70 percent or so of the population being immunized would allow for true herd immunity to take place. That is likely to happen somewhere in the month of May or something like that, based on our plans. I really hope and look forward to seeing that the level of uh, negative perception of the vaccine decreases and people's acceptance increase. That's going to be critical to help us. Most people need to be immunized before we can go back to a normal life. All right, the experts making a final plea before the holiday. Stay home. Don't travel. Don't share this virus with your family or friends. Let's save hundreds of thousands of lives this holiday period, shall we? All right, my conversation with Celeste Headley coming up. But before that, it's time for a news dump. News dump. News Dump and Stand Up with Pete Dominic is brought to you this month by GiveWell. GiveWell.org. We're only weeks from Giving Tuesday. If you want to be confident your charitable giving goes the best and furthest, go to GiveWell.org slash Stand Up with Pete. All right. The strong rumor on Sunday night is that Joe Biden is going to is expected to nominate a guy named Anthony Blinken as Secretary of State, according to Bloomberg News. 
and the New York Times. Anthony Blinken will join his cabinet as the next Secretary of State on Tuesday. Jake Sullivan, formerly one of Hillary Clinton's aides, is also likely to be named National Security Advisor, Bloomberg reported. Anthony Blinken is formerly the State Department's number two. He's expected to try to reestablish the United States as a trusted ally to rejoin global agreements and court multilateral efforts to confront China and convince the rest of the world we're not absolutely crazy. Anthony Blinken with a tough job ahead. Sad news that the horrific disease ALS has taken yet another person. Pat Quinn is the co-founder of the Ice Bucket Challenge. He died at age 37 after losing his battle with ALS, but certainly brought more attention probably to the disease than almost anybody else who wasn't already I guess a celebrity. Police in Wisconsin have arrested a 15-year-old in connection with a mall shooting that injured eight people, but luckily didn't kill anyone. The G20 summit concluded with a vow to provide COVID-19 vaccines for all and a statement from President Trump saying climate change is a hoax and it was just trying to destroy America. And uh, thank God he's not going to be involved anymore. And a Florida man is drawing praise, according to NBC News, for valiantly saving his puppy from the jaws of an alligator. Richard Wilbanks, 74, was just enjoying the sun, NBCNews.com writes, when he heard his new puppy, Gunner, crying. An alligator in the backyard pond in his Lee County home and grabbed the dog and pulled it in the water. And you gotta see the video. The guy's like 75 years old and he has a cigar in his mouth and he runs in the pond. It's a little baby alligator and a little dog and he never takes the cigar out of his mouth. Here's Richard Wilbanks, the hero, in his own words from the NBC affiliate in Fort Myers, Florida. Oh, it was just a shock. It happened so fast that, uh, you know, it, instinct just took over. Will Banks says that he was enjoying a beautiful fall day outside with his dog Gunner when all of a sudden he heard a cry for help from the young puppy. And adrenaline kicked in and, you know, I just went right in the water after the gator and Gunner. An alligator in their backyard pond had Gunner in its grasp. That's when Will Banks shot up from his seat. As soon as I heard Gunner yelp, uh, I looked and saw the gator going under the water with him. Wilbank's wife, Luis, was inside their house at the time and said she was full of shock when she saw this. And he had the dog, and he is covered in blood, not the dog. So I was just like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Wilbanks walked away with only a few cuts, but the life-threatening moment took a while to sink in. Everything's going through my mind. He said an alligator, and I was like, you got to be kidding me. I, I mean, I really did not... All right, I'm telling you, it was like maybe a foot and a half long, two feet long, the alligator, and it's a little dog. So nonetheless, the guy was all the way in the water. You got to see it. I thought that was a, a good story to end the news dump on. Okay, now to my guest for today's show. I wanted to just have it be Celeste and I on today's episode. I've got some great guests coming up this week still. Ruth ben Giat, Dr. Eddie Gloud Jr., and comedian Judy Gold, just to name a few. And then I think I'll probably take Thursday and Friday off, but maybe I'll still post stuff for you. Either way, I had a great conversation with Celeste Headley, who I have known for years because she used to be the host of The Takeaway, and The Takeaway used to be on the same channel I was on, on SiriusXM, even though it was a WNYC and uh, NPR affiliate-based show. But I've followed her work and listened to her on the radio, on NPR, and on PBS. I've seen her TED Talks. And now I'm reading uh, both of her books uh, from 2017 and her new book, uh, which is just out this year, Nothing, How to Break Away from Overworking, Overdoing, and Underliving. It came out in March, and it's so really important and really interesting, as is her first book. We need to talk how to have conversations that matter. My wife heard her on another podcast and said, you've got to listen to this woman. She is going to really help you become a better interviewer. I was like, OK, thank you. And I did. And she was so good. And I reached right out to her to talk to her about both of these books. We had a wonderful, wide ranging conversation that I'm really proud of. And, and I learned a lot from reading these books. And I, I, I was about to say one more than the other, but both of them are so important. She's such a brilliant and graceful, thoughtful, articulate and very funny woman and i really enjoy talking to her and i think that you're going to enjoy our conversation too you can also hear celeste on her weekly series retro report on pbs watch her ted talk get her books follow her on twitter at celeste headley 
Here's my conversation with Celeste Headley right now. All right, there she is, Celeste Headley. I'm so excited to have you joining me. I just realized I wasn't recording the Zoom, but now I am, and everybody can see you too. Thank you, Celeste, for joining me. I'm so excited to have you. Thank you. It's good to see you again. I know. I don't know when the last time we saw each other. I don't know how we met each other. All I know is that I have been a fan of you for so long that sometimes I would turn on NPR and not recognize, I confess, that it was you and go, oh, my gosh, who is this person doing this interview? It's brilliant. Oh, my gosh, that's Celeste. Such a fan and so happy to, to have you joining me. It's it's good to see your face and hear your voice. Um, you've got a new book out. Uh, you've got two books that I really want to talk about. Uh, Do Nothing, How to Break Away from Overworking, Overdoing and Underliving. And I want to start with this discussion. First of all, the book came out uh, at what time in conjunction with the pandemic and when we started quarantining? So the book came out on, I think, like a Tuesday. And then um, on a, you know, Wednesday, I had a whole, you know, I was supposed to be starting my book tour and all this stuff. I was up in New York City um, and on Wednesday, I got through like most of my schedule of things. And then I got up Thursday morning and and, and New York was shut down and the book tour was over <laughs> and I headed home. Yeah. So does that ruin in any way uh, take away from what anything you're writing? Because I feel like um, not the book tour, but I feel like this book is so helpful right now. You didn't write it with the idea that life was going to change dramatically, but I actually find it more helpful in my life now than even before when I had more structure. Yeah, I hear that from a lot of people. Um, and I wish I could say I was so genius that I, I knew this was coming. No one did. I mean, I think that all of the indicators that we were headed in a bad direction were there. And those were sort of the trends I was identifying as I wrote the book. And one of the reasons um quarantining at home has been so difficult for so pe- so many people and been so detrimental to people's well-being is because we were already headed in the wrong direction you know what i mean we yeah. were already had this unhealthy balance with work so a uh when your work is your entitled entire social interactions and then you're not going into work anymore you're in trouble right so it was we were already set up to not handle this well yeah, yeah. Pe- I don't think anybody realized how limited their interactions with other human beings was going to be and how much that was going to bother them. Because some people probably were like, I, I hate the people I work with, not realizing that know, the interaction, though, itself was in many ways healthy, even though you might not have liked some of those people. I've been really amused to see the number of people who have said, gee, I thought I was an introvert and it turns out that I'm not. I need to see people and touch people and say hello to people Um, because I've been trying to tell people for a really long time that you're you're not probably not an introvert. So, I mean, amused, obviously, in light of the fact that this is a terrible situation, I think one tiny, slight, thin silver lining is perhaps more people are beginning to realize how much we depend on each other. And that's a good thing. Uh, the, the, the subtitle, how to break away from overworking, overdoing and underliving. I think my favorite discovery in reading the book is that this isn't new. And you did a, a deep dive and a lot of research on, on the history of, of work life balance and, and how we work and how the industrial age comes into play as a, as a really important time period. How how far back do you go? Yeah, at least. Well, the research went back to, you know, ancient Greece, like as early as we could get uh, records of people's work. But th- this unhealthy addiction or this unhealthy belief that work is what makes us valuable, that we can trace back to the Industrial Revolution. You know, I mean, that was one of the big takeaways for me is because. We humankind had lived a certain way for most of our 300,000 years. Right. And everything changed. I don't know about your schooling, um, but nobody really limited is the answer. Limited. Yeah. Nobody really got across to me how just 
seismic was the shift when the industrial age occurred? How many things changed? Because we changed pretty much everything about our relationship to each other, our relationship with work, our, our days, how we structure our days. And we've just been leaning in every generation since till we've gotten to this point now where we either have to sort of change or die. I hate to be cliche about it, but that's true. Uh, no, there's there's a lot of truth in, in uh, the the fatalism, the 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 danger of of all of this. And we can get into that because I learned a lot of it from you. But so what you're trying to tell me. Is that my work and my productivity is not what makes me valuable? Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> I hope that you don't believe that, Pete. Um, I hope no, that- I actually I'm not even tongue in cheek. I was tongue in cheek in the in the tone, but no, I do believe that, and that's why your book has made me cry a little bit because it's like unwinding some real shit for me. No, I absolutely have always thought I have to constantly be productive in every way, in every possible way, or else I'm not moving forward. And you even, I think push back on the idea of of moving forward of that being progress so help me doctor yeah i mean it's this odd this odd idea we have now that we have to be improving all the time that we are always becoming and never being and even more so that it's hmm. doing that signals progress as a but if you look throughout nature that's just not the case right i mean like there are some incredibly evolved animals that are not doing all the time. And, you know, one of the things I found very interesting in this book is when um, I, I landed on idleness theory, right? This idea that the most successful organism in, organisms in nature are actually the ones who have to do less work. Because if you need to do a huge amount of work in order to survive, that makes you less uh, resilient. It makes you, it makes you less adaptable. That in fact, the more efficient you are, the more often you're able to enjoy leisure that actually makes you healthier and therefore a more successful organism. That's such interesting research. By the way, when, when you explain that, I, I start thinking about a, a domesticated cat or dog and that you live with. And so you're always seeing that animal and you're like, what the fuck? What do you do all day? You do nothing. <laughs> That must be nice. And every time, by the way, I say that must be nice. I'm like, yeah, but you have a 10 year lifespan. But I mean, like, that's not a good example because they're domesticated. I mean, th thinking about animals and nature, plants, bugs, everything. But if what you're saying is true, I would think that for profit capitalists would would leverage that data and say, don't work so much. Take more breaks. Um, take more time off so that you can be more productive for us, thus making more money. How come that isn't necessarily the case and how come the opposite feels true if you're working for somebody else they expect you to always be working so yeah and this is where we i was able to really dig into the history of basically the brainwashing that's occurred over two yes years. let's get at it and so there's two parts to what you're talking about the first one is why aren't managers and leadership let, giving us more time off. I'm going to deal with that in just a second. Right. But first, let's talk about the the cult that we're all in, the brainwashing. Um, and and I thought that it would have been just a byproduct of the capitalist system, but in fact, it was quite intentional, very intentional. That corporate leaders and even government governments and politicians realized they could use the exact same tactics they used during the war uh, in, in to manipulate people and persuade people and they could use it on their own citizens and what they did was try to persuade people that the longer hours you worked the better person you were that the more dedicated you were to your job the better uh citizen you were the more patriotic you were uh, the more deserving mm. you were of any good thing that yep. came to you and I mean, that's obvious why a corporate leader would want that, right? Because then they don't have to pay you more for the extra hours. You get to a situation where right now people will work long hours, even if they're unpaid, which is insane to me. Or all the billions of dollars we donate back to our jobs because we don't take vacation time that is coming to us or sick time that's coming to us. So that's the first thing is it has been an intentional brainwashing. Then you asked about why managers uh, don't give us more time off. I don't know. They're still using 18th century tactics on a 21st century workforce. When every single time we study this, we discover that working long hours makes you less productive and not more. So why they don't do that? 
they're they're just antiquated, I guess. It's interesting when you write about, you know, uh, less productive or I think you say, you know, you're more likely to make errors. And it's like yesterday I did like 12 hours, uh, felt really good about the podcast, posted it for the wrong day. <laughs> kill me. Fuck, kill me. I wake up to like a million t- <laughs> texts, tweets. There was a listener at my door. I was like, is it up yet? No, I exaggerate a little bit about how much people like to show. Uh, they don't show up. But I, it was it was a devastating error. And I've made that kind of error more than once. And it's because like I just can't possibly check on it all. My, I think it's about brain function. I can't. Uh, diagnose it, but it's it's definitely about brain function, just being overloaded with things and distractions. And how did I miss that? Yeah, I mean, our brains just aren't designed to to work 12 hours at full capacity. So at some point, your brain will just stop functioning well, because it, it can't anymore. Um, and you can keep pushing. <laughs> you can you can do that. Not going to be great. I mean, we've studied this over and over again. You're yeah. going to make more mistakes. So the other thing that I often bring up in the, in these kind of work life balance discussion is kind of America's idea of capitalism or American work culture versus let's say European. And you get into this as well. And I always cite Italy because it's where my wife's family lives and, and they shut down at 1 PM every day. And then for like a month, <laughs> like in August. And that's bizarre. Oh, and they take a nap. They take a nap. I recently heard someone on this, actually on my podcast, I was interviewing Bruce Bartlett, and this so stuck with me. He said, I take a nap every day for 30 years. I'm like, what? First of all, napping is seen as weakness and laziness. But so I said something like that to him. He goes, no, it's like having two full days. The nap is recharging. The nap in European culture, the, 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 take, the closing the shop at 1 p.m., What's the difference, Les, between American work culture and, say, European work culture? Who's got it better? Is there any way to make that a binary? I mean, you could make it a binary. That's how we do they in media to get ratings. <laughs> yeah. OK. Europe has it better. Um, <laughs> Come on. So here's here's how this works. Think think of it this way. Um When Americans are working, very often we spend a good portion of our day in fight or flight mode. Because we've pushed beyond our capacity to think pro- properly. So we get, for example, when your brain is tired and it can't go through the whole process of careful thinking and deep thinking, it's just going to shut down that part and it's going to rely on the grooves and the gray matter that are already there. Meaning we're always going to come to the same solutions. We're going to think the same things. Those neural pathways will just follow the same familiar things because mm. that absorbs the least amount of energy. The other way to think about this is that um, Europeans, they don't really have less productivity that, than we have. In fact, in many industries, places like Germany or Denmark have more productivity than we have. But you can't just measure productivity. You have to measure innovation and creativity and also retention, right? Mm. Like, how long can they keep an employee there so that they don't have to go through the expense and and time investment of training a new person? America's not that great at it. We burn through employees like we're burning matches. So it's not great for our our well-being. It's not great for us, our capitalist system. I mean, look, the, for the past tw- two years that we've uh, that we've measured it for the first time ever. The life expectancy has gone down in the United States. Crazy. Down. Important and, step. Yeah. And when they asked the doctor the, who wrote the most recent study report, the lead author in any case, what was killing people, he said despair. How does despair, how does loneliness, words like that, how do they kill us? So obviously it's not a direct line. Almost nothing is in in medicine, but it's as close as you can get. I mean, loneliness, for example, and social isolation is as bad for you as smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. It's as bad as morbid obesity. It degrades your internal organs. I mean, one of the studies that I cite in in the book is this one in which they brought in couples and, you know, gave them small wounds on their arms (laughs) and then measured how quickly they healed. Hmm. And those who had a healthy relationship at home healed almost twice as fast as those who did not. 
I mean, the, the, we're human beings. We just don't seem to want to accept how much we need healthy social relationships and we and how much we need to invest in those social relationships instead of pouring everything into our work. But um, I don't know if you read about this, but what do you think about the idea? I hear this all of the time with people, and I suppose I experience it in certain situations, but social anxiety, because if the answer is to be more connected and to be less introverted and, uh, and, and have more of a community of people around you, but you have a problem whenever you're around people, you feel uncomfortable. How do you square that circle? What is your advice for people who have that social anxiety, if you have any? Because um, I hear that a lot, and it's kind of foreign to me. I love talking to people, but sometimes. Okay, so it's become very trendy to think of ourselves as introverted. That's become a trend. <laughs> um, it's weird, <laughs> but I hear and, it, yeah. And uh, the fact of the matter is, is that there's very very few true introverts mm. in the world. Mm. I mean, if you think about it, these are terms, introversion and extroversion that Carl Jung invented. And you have to think of it as a spectrum, right? So on one extreme end are the true extroverts and on one end is the true introverts. Um, Adam Grant, Love Adam Grant. Yeah. Yeah, he has done a lot of work on this. <clears throat> and what he will tell you is that the vast majority of people are in the middle. They're ambiverts. They mm. uh, sometimes need time alone. They sometimes enjoy being around a bunch of people. They are the healthiest people because they're more adaptable. They live longer lives because, frankly, if you actually are a true introvert, you're, you have a shorter lifespan. Um, and there's a number of different measures that make it difficult for someone who actually is an introvert. But luckily, very few people are. But here's where it becomes dangerous, Pete, is because people think they're an introvert which means they're intentionally going to avoid social situations, which means their social skills deteriorate right. so that the next time right. they're in a social situation, it's not going to go well, which makes them more likely to think that they're an introvert. Rinse and repeat. And then you end up with someone who, who possibly honestly does feel social anxiety, but it's unnecessary. It's such a great way of explaining it. It's so true. It's like saying, I'm not good at baseball anymore. It's because you stopped playing. You're not playing anymore. How could you? I, I'm not good at. I don't. I'm not good at guitar anymore. I used to be good. You don't pick up your guitar anymore. You're not going to be good at talking to people if you stop talking to people. That's what I heard. It's totally true. But here's. I mean, you asked for tips, so let me give people tips. Yes, please. A. a a social interaction doesn't have to be a two-hour phone call or standing in a party, right? right? Um. There's something that is called the power of weak ties, uh, which means that we take psychologically, emotionally, we take incredible benefit from these little tiny exchanges with like your grocery store clerk. How's the weather? Uh, it's colder, whatever it may be. Those little meaningless interactions actually have an outsized impact. OK, so when I heard you first talking about this. I rejected it because I do a joke in my stand up act called I hate small talk, hate it as a as a someone who talks for a living as a comedian. I want my every interaction to be deep and thoughtful and 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 have growth. I have such an issue with it and I'm so ashamed of this and I really mean this that when I was taking a walk with my mom a year ago here in our neighborhood, she was saying hi to everybody and I scolded her. Like, we don't we don't do that here. You don't need to do that. Stop. It makes oh, people mom. uncomfortable when you they're just in nature walking, mom. And you're like, hi, how are you? They're, they're, you've broken whatever they're thinking about. Like, I really scolded my mom for that. After hearing you talk about it, I, I let's be clear. I was like, it's Celeste. So I'll listen because <laughs> I have a lot of respect for you. And then you. as you talked, I was like, motherfucker, she's right. So I interrupted you on that point, though, about small talk conversations at the grocery store. And sorry, mom, I apologize sincerely right now. She listens. So what's continue on the small talk and why it's important? Yeah. And you'll see this from some of the best researchers. The, the Nicholas Epley out of Chicago says, you know, these tiny little things like the way he says it is hardly anybody waves, but everybody waves back. And when we measure it, we see an improved movement in your mood. And not only that, but it includes 
it increases people's feeling of belonging. If you're walking down the street and somebody acknowledges you, even with eye contact, it makes you feel like you belong in that neighborhood. As opposed to if you walked around and nobody looked at you, like sometimes happens in New York, um, it makes you feel like you're an outsider and you don't belong. So this is how you can help to create community. Another thing I will say to somebody who it maybe it's funny, you said that I brought that New York attitude to the suburbs where I live and my mom never had that New York attitude because she's always grown up in like rural and suburban areas. So that's so funny that you say like we don't talk here. My mom's like, shut. I t-. anyway, I interrupted you again. Go ahead. <laughs> Mama Dominic, you deserve an apology. Sorry, mom. Um, so uh, the other thing I was going to say is that. Asking questions is one of the best things you can do in conversation, and it completely relieves the pressure. You know, Terry Gross, who hosts Fresh Air Mm -hmm. on NPR, she says the only icebreaker you'll ever need is tell me about yourself. And this is absolutely true. So talking about oneself, what's known as self-disclosure, activates the same pleasure center in the brain as sex and heroin. It is inherently pleasurable. So if you ask people questions and allow them to talk about themselves, you're giving them a great deal of pleasure. You don't have to say very much, but they're going to walk away thinking you're the best conversationalist in the world. Because you're talking about listening, which is so much uh, about what your last book is about. And I want to get into that as well. Um, but just before we uh, we move on to that, staying with Do Nothing, How to Break Away from Overworking, Overdoing, and Underliving, which is a book everybody should buy. Um, it's so important and so helpful and so cathartic for, I think, everybody. Even if, even if you, I mean, everybody thinks they're really busy because they are for any number of reasons, whether you're mostly primarily taking care of your kids who are young or you're a freelancer doing 15 jobs and taking care of kids, no matter what it is, people feel really busy. You're telling us to do nothing. Give me the personal part of this book, how you came to it. You're a super successful person in pretty much anything that you've done in music and speaking and broadcasting and journalism. And I'm sure as a parent. So what is your personal story? Because I love to hear someone like you who I have on a pedestal criticize herself. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm, I was successful as a parent in that I got him to 18 and he's now 22 alive. Right. So that's, that's a low bar achievement, but you know, Hey, look, the kids are always trying to kill themselves always. (laughs) So like you're just running around like a liability attorney. Um, (laughs) It's so funny. (laughs) Um, I didn't expect to write this book, which is I've told a lot of people, I'm not sure everyone believes me, but the this book came because I was trying to solve my own problem because I was so addicted to work. I had such a problem saying no um, to projects. As soon as I was like, oh, that's a cool project. I got to do it, right? I, I couldn't turn down things that might be the key. They might be the opportunity that I need, yeah. right? Yeah. And I was overcommitted and I was exhausted and I was irritable and I was not happy and I was earning way more money than I ever had before in my life, which I had thought was the key Mm -hmm. to happiness. Mm -hmm. I had looked ahead to when, you know, when I have enough money, I'll do all these things. Um, These things will be better. And it was worse. It was worse. And then I quit my job. I'm like, well, that's the problem. My boss sucks. (laughs) I'm going to go and have control of my own schedule. Mm -hmm. It again got worse. Hmm. And so every single thing that I tried to solve it, that I had been told my whole life were the solutions did not work. And I had to, I had to break it all apart. I had to throw out all that conventional wisdom and say, okay, what is causing this? And when I began to peel that onion, there just was, it just kept going back and back and back. Well, what you refer to as conventional wisdom, I think, is also what you referred to earlier as brainwashing and a cult and specifically this cult of work productiveness um, and, and efficiency. You talk about Bertrand Russell. I mean, this stuff goes way back. And I think what's different, I was talking to my dad about this recently. I was like, Dad, the difference between us now and when you work, my dad owned a, a, an insurance agency, is that when you would come home, you weren't working anymore. You could turn it off. There was no way, even if you wanted to, really, you could. There's no email. Now 
you're constantly inundated with information and emails and questions and texts. You could, if you wanted to, and if you feel the need, work all day, every day. And a lot of people do. And that's the conventional wisdom. That's the brainwashing. That's the cult of efficiency of work. You're saying that's all wrong. Yeah, it's all bunk. And and when you say work all day and all night, that's almost literally true because to your brain, that cell phone represents work. Yes. There are people who sleep with it in their hands. Right? I sleep with it. I sleep with it. Um, I have one between my knees because I don't like my knees touching one phone. And then I have an iPad that's like a, some people have a hug pillow. I just have an iPad that alerts me anytime. Any single time my favorite journalists tweet. So I wake up every about every five seconds. Right. But to your brain, you are not never not working. Right. Never. And so you never get. a. So, of course, our amygdala, our, our monkey brain is in control all the time. We're being our cars are being steered by toddlers. I mean, that's what the fight or flight. <laughs> yeah. <of our> brain <laughs> is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I sometimes at the end of my day, and because I'm a huge nature person, you talk about the importance of uh, you said something like uh, everybody has 10 minutes to go out in nature without their phone. I believe for me, it's a triumph if I take the dog for a walk or go for a run without my phone. I come home and ask for compliments from my family. I just left my phone here and went for a run. (laughs) And my wife goes. Well, thank God you're back because literally the world stopped waiting for you to come back. Like everybody froze <laughs> everywhere waiting for you to return to your, your phone. Your wife is a smart ass. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> and but the point is, there are days not too often, I'm proud to say, but there are way too many days where at the end of the day, Celeste, I'm like, oh, my God, I did not go outside except for the walk out to the shed and back, which is cool where I broadcast from here, uh, uh, tape from, but not going out in nature. A whole day. What a wasted day. Yeah. What a loss that I missed that. But we're all in this this sort of um, push to the edge. We even if it's not true, um, we all have this very real sense that of urgency and looming catastrophe. And it gets worse if you're not doing something. We've gotten brainwashed to the point that if you stop for just a moment, you feel bad about yourself. Yes, that's me. (laughs) Yeah, this is therapy, by the way, this whole book is therapy for me. And I don't think that I'm special. I think pretty much everybody, regardless of the industry that they're working in, is this way. I feel I have gotten emails and messages from people like tearful um, because they're like, oh, my God, your book made me realize how bad it had gotten. Like I'd just been going ahead, charging ahead and not realized the choices I'd made. And I mean, that's awesome i'm t- i'm i'm horrified that we've all gotten to this point but i'm there with you right this book comes out of my own personal addiction to this crap yep and it's you know it's funny because i i do some interviews sometimes where they do what they think of as a gotcha question where they're like well you wrote this whole book about doing nothing and yet look at all the stuff you're doing i'm like yeah but you don't realize that because i'm <laughs> following the advice in my book it only takes me half a day to do all that stuff and then I spend the rest of the day playing with Legos and <laughs> up Celeste. I'm going to do my impression of that. Whoever that person was Celeste. Um, now you've written a book uh, called do nothing. Uh, but as far as I can tell, uh, you're working quite a bit. I mean, yeah, you're are you really lots of things. taking your own advice? Celeste Headley. <laughs> oh, you got me. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what do you do? I mean, I know that you're a musician and I heard you say something about that you you picked up a guitar. You're not really playing with Legos, are you? I mean, it's fine if you are, but. I am, absolutely. Really? You do Legos? Yeah. What do you do? My son and I, so my son and I have this longstanding tradition. And Isn't he, he like 32? Home, he's 22. <laughs> 22. You, go ahead. Uh, and we get those creator sets that have like 8,000 pieces and he'll come home and we'll do them together. And it's so fun. It's like the best. Activity. Did you have him when you were seven? You look like you're seriously. I hate to make such a hacky compliment, but you, I was watching your Ted talk. I'm like, how? And I've known you for a long time. I'm like, how old is Celeste? That's awesome that you do Legos with him. That's so cool that you guys do that. What else do you what other some of the other things that you now do and and. Do you really not feel a tug, uh, a guilt when you're doing them? 
I don't anymore. I did for quite a while. It's yeah. taken me a, a to two practice. and a half years Wow. Um, to break free. Um, but no, I, I have like 30 house plants. I grow my own herbs. Um, I take my walk for my dog for a walk, like for 90 minutes a day, um, two, How like four dare you? minute walks. Um, you are selfish with your time. I am. That is, I, to hear you say that is, is like, again, I'm, I feel like permission, especially cause it's you saying it to me. I, I'm like, wow, you do that. That's so great and healthy. And then you still do all of the other things that you do. I want to follow you around and figure it out. Yeah. I mean, I put it, it's all there in the, I mean, how I did it's all there in the book. If you are working with your brain's strengths and understanding how best the care and feeding of the human being, right? How we work at our best, then you don't have to run out around like an idiot, you know, pushing yourself and making yourself unhealthy and unhappy. You can actually get a ton done. You can be more productive in those fewer hours per day. How do we start with an audit of our time? Yeah, you have to start with the audit. I mean, part because part of the delusion is, is that we don't have time. And I think I described this in the book. It's been a while since I wrote it. But um, there was this one moment when I came home uh, from work and I sat down on my couch and I was like, oh, I cannot. Pa I don't have the energy to cook dinner. I'm going to just order in. And I love to cook. Right. So this is odd. Um, and then I started looking in my kitchen at all the time saving devices I have in there that my grandmother didn't have. Right. The dishwasher and the microwave and the ninja air fryer and the what? instant pot. You and my, are doing well. <laughs> and my uh, my robot vacuum, you know, and I know you don't have one. Oh, I do. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I then took a pad of paper and I went around my house and added up just a, an estimate of how much extra time I have per week than my grandmother. And it was like over 20 hours. Probably. Wow. Hmm. And yet she was in the PTA and the Rotary Club. And when she went on a vacation, she invited her neighbors over to look at slides and she did all this stuff. And I'm like, how do I have less time? So that's why I started with the audit, because part of the delusion is this idea that we have that we are slammed to the wall busy. And it turns out we're just not. It's this it's the fight or flight that's constantly making us feel that way. The feeling is real. But in truth, you have more time than you think. So important to do that audit. I started uh, doing that when I started reading your book, too. And it's really interesting um, what I wrote down and, and, and what I've been doing with my time and how much Ooh, time. Dish. Dish. Um, well, I wrote down, like, went to the bathroom, showered. Like, I wrote down some of the mundane, normal human biological things, thinking about, like, how long I was doing some of those things that I'm not mindful of I try to practice mindfulness and I don't think about a lot of that and I find eating I know you love to cook you love to eat I'm very weird about food I find it burdensome to and, and unproductive to make food and even to eat food imagine that because I'm like this is a waste of time well you're deep into it the cult oh you're yeah oh yeah yeah, d absolutely deep in. But also the only thing that sep uh, I think separates me from most of the call is my value of sleep and, na and napping. I realize how important that's going to be. So at least I get that done. Oh, yeah. But sleep is good. So I'm also charting that. Um, there's so much goodness in this book. Do nothing. Um, but I, I do also have to ask you about the book you wrote before that. We need to talk because I think it's so relevant how to have conversations that matter. And now more than ever, and this isn't for people who interview people for a living like you and I super helpful for that. And I have a lot of questions that were a kind of inside baseball, but it's not it's for everybody. This book, especially now with the divisiveness of our country and politics. So what do we do now, Celeste, when our neighbor, our family member, our friend, maybe even our partner believes something so different than what we believe in today's day and age? Do I really need to listen to them talk about JFK coming back? Uh, you JFK Jr. I mean, is the don't theory. necessarily have to listen to that, but you have to listen to them. Right. Um, it's interesting that when people disagree on one thing, 
they then think they can't talk to somebody mm -hmm. when you don't have to talk about that one thing. I, 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 I say this a lot that there's this, you know, the blog uh, shit my dad says. Yeah. Yeah. So there's one point which is his dad is dispensing wisdom because the son is complaining that there's some guy that hates him. And he's like, don't talk to him. You don't go to the park and put your blanket down next to the only pile of dog shit. <laughs> and it's the same thing in conversation. You don't have to talk about that one thing. You can talk about other stuff. It doesn't make you, uh, uh, it doesn't, it's not a cop out. It doesn't mean you're a, 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 a you know, the conversation isn't worth anything. Mm -hmm. It's just that, look, we're not going to agree on that. I actually think that's pretty crazy. Um, and so let's talk about something else. I've been conducting this experiment as a result of you writing about that. I think you'll be proud of it and impressed with it. When I get in shitty fights on Twitter and I do, and I'm really uh, immature and silly about them and a jerk oftentimes, I never start them, never. But people start them with me and I go, so I'll say to the guy, it's always a guy, pretty much, except for Amy Kremer. Um, I'll say to him, why don't you call me? Just a random person on Twitter, Celeste. They'll call me and I'll take your exact advice. I'll talk with them about everything but our argument. Oh, you're in the cars. You have a family, whatever it is. And what you're saying is absolutely 100% true. Then we pivot to politics, maybe. And we usually argue, but it's a completely different conversation. It would be if we just picked up on that one thing and didn't talk about the fact that he's got three kids, that he lives in Iowa, and he's really interested in these types of TV shows. Amazing. Yeah. It, it really it works. Solves what you're saying. a lot of problems because, you know, we, we, you can create an empathic bond with someone that even if you disagree with them, it makes you more likely to treat them with respect. And it's that whole process of recognizing that person as a human being instead of, of seeing them as their, their political opinion. Yes. Or seeing them as the person they voted for. Human beings are complicated and they're nuanced. And we think we know why somebody voted for either Trump or Bernie. We think we know that. We know that story, right? You don't. Human beings are weird. <laughs> weird. When you say stuff, I believe it. You could tell me right now. That's a, that's where I have you in my in my world. Like if you were like, no, Pete, the earth is flat. I'd be like, oh, my, I mean, oh, shit, I can't even believe Celeste is saying that. Sounds so weird. But let me you look that up. Why did she think that? <laughs> Speaking of which, how do I talk to someone who I find to be a virulent racist? Should I, Can I talk to that person? How do I talk to that person? I'm so really glad you uh, asked this question, because right now at this moment, I am working on a book due January 10th on how to talk about race, regardless of your color and your politics. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, um, yeah, like literally walking you through the conversation itself oh, how to get through it. Great. I didn't know that. That's exciting. Go ahead. So number one, we have to accept that there's no such thing as a, an authority on race. I don't mean like race scholars. Obviously, they're important and smart. I'm talking about the fact that at this moment, there are seven billion and change different experiences with race. Um, if you were to ask me my race, I would tell you I'm either black or mixed race. But actually, I'm black and Jewish and Native American and Scotch Irish and all these other things. My in in inherent experience and understanding of race is going to be different from everybody else's. And that makes the conversation actually easier because instead of talking about race, this big overarching concept, you talk to them about their experience with race, which you don't know anything about. It's always going to be an exercise in discovery and it's going to be true in that as long as they're as long as I'm telling you about my personal experience with race. It's true. That's my personal experience. Then it doesn't become this argument over statistics and data and all these other things. You got to keep it personal. But your personal experiences with race are what have led you to be a racist. My father-in-law, who I don't talk to, he doesn't listen to the show. He is convinced his racism is rooted in the fact that he worked on the line assembly line at Ford and he was passed over for a promotion because of affirmative action. And they gave it to a black guy. He talks about it. If you say hello to him, that's it. So like, that's his experience. And I'm not supposed to, I'm supposed to value that. 
No, you don't have to value it at all. Um, so here's the other way to think about I'm supposed about to this. hear it. I have to listen to it. Yeah. How, how do I deal with it? You don't even, I don't think you necessarily have to listen to it. I draw the line at things that are uh, offensive or don't recognize my own humanity or the humanity of others, period. And so I'll say to someone, hey, listen, you're grouping a whole group of people together. You clearly have a lot of hatred toward that group. That's not acceptable. But let me ask you this and I'll ask them another question and I'll get them onto some other line. Mm. You know, there is one of the chapters in the book that I'm writing is when it has, is called when it's worked. And it's just basically walking through stories of people who have been talked out of hatred and it never happened instantaneously. Right. And it never happened because of someone had great arguments uh, and statistics and data. And it mine are all- pretty good. I bet they are. <laughs> They're based on a, everybody else's. Yeah. But yeah. The, it's always happened because someone has felt safe um, expressing themselves, safe in that they weren't going to be physically attacked or, mm. or, or themselves denied humanity, but also that they felt some kind of mutual respect there, that they mm. were heard. You know, it's interesting if you listen to some of the people like Christopher, uh, Christian Picciolini yeah. um, and some of the others, uh, Derek Black, who is uh, David Duke's godson. And if you talk to them about what brought them out of hatred, they'll explain that the reason people get into hatred, hate groups, um, I'm not calling your your father-in-law a neo-Nazi, but I'm just saying uh, <laughs> it is because they, they want to feel like they matter. They want to feel they belong. And this group makes them feel that way. What if we were able to give the people a feeling of, you know, your hatred is unacceptable, but you're still a human being mm. and I can respect you as a fellow human being. But those things that you're saying aren't acceptable. Part of being a racist um, it, it being believing in certain things is being part of a community or a club of people yeah. who believe certain things. And if you take something as, you know, less inflammatory as, as race, uh, maybe people get together because they all like to play Legos. I mean, there are they, groups for everything and you can find community in so many different places uh, that that the the purpose of the community isn't around something like you know uh, anti government or hatred for a certain ethnicity like what we're talking about with neo Nazi groups or Klan groups or Proud Boys things like that. Yeah. Um, well, let me ask you a specific question about. I'm you know you could probably write also write a book. You're writing this book about race and racism, um, but you could write one about sex and sexism. So this question that I had, this argument specifically that I make, I want you to tell me what's wrong with it or how I can refine it. But I say to people often, I'll say, listen, if you want to know what's racist in, in, in general, then ask about black, white racism, then ask black people. If you want to know who or what is sexist in general, ask women like then you'll know, like you don't have to be a scholar. Just ask them. They generally will agree on certain behaviors and things be what's wrong with that does that further discussion when i say it is it a good argument i use it a lot no i think that's perfectly fine understanding that sometimes i don't want to explain sexism to people i I think (laughs) well yeah it's um, not it's yes yeah it's not their responsibility Right. To, to, so you don't have to ask have them, to but if, consent if, first. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but, you know, here's the thing. I would take it one step further. I <laughs> well think said. that's actually perfectly fine. Um, many black people, though, will say, do your own goddamn Fair reading. Enough. Right? Fair do enough. Do the reading. But here's what I would say is that if somebody points out something to you, if somebody says to you, wow, that was racist. We take that personally and understandably so. We see that as an indictment of ourselves. I want people to learn to flip that script and say, you know what? This is a gift that someone has just given me because I wasn't even all of us have implicit and unconscious biases we're not aware of. Um, And it's very, very difficult for other people to bring those up. It's uncomfortable and awkward. And so when somebody actually does an attempt to make us aware of our own implicit biases, Mm. that's a gift. I mean, the scientists who study implicit bias say even being aware of your implicit bias doesn't make it easier for you to combat them. So when other people are helping you in that journey, that's a good thing. It's such a great point. I'm so I was going to ask you about uh, biases. And so I'm really glad that you answered that. But I, I like to think that I 
recognize my implicit biases and that makes me better. But A, I don't and B, it doesn't. That's right. And research backs you up on that. According, yeah, according to call implicit. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, uh, all right, last question. And I've, I love this conversation about conversations. I think it's so crucially important right now. Both your books are so relevant and important. I think people should Thank buy you. both them because they will both make you a better human being, family member, friend, citizen, and I think happier in, in general and more, more content with your life and not so stressed out about something. I can keep going on. But I think it's really interesting, and I was really profoundly moved learning uh, about listening and how often when I'm doing an interview like this one, I'm thinking about what I'm going to ask you next to keep it going. And that takes me out of the conversation and makes it harder to listen. And and how do I do better? And what does the data say about a conversation, even like the one we're having in terms of how do we listen and respond and move the conversation along, especially when I'm taping it in hopes that people will in, enjoy it and be enlightened by it as opposed to you and I just just shooting the shit. Well, one thing that you're doing that's really good is I see you taking like a note here and there and yes. then you return to the conversation, Yes. which for interviewers, that's absolutely the strategy you should do. Something comes to you about something you want to ask about, you note it down and then you can return. Your brain just can't focus on both things. So while you're sitting there trying to hold on to that thought mm. of what you want to ask next, next, you won't be able to listen to what the other person is saying. So absolutely take the note and then go back. Um, you can be a little bit kinder to yourself by understanding that listening is hard for humans, period. We struggle to do it. Um, it actually burns a trace amount of glucose, not enough to help you lose weight, <laughs> but it's just an example of the fact that it actually takes energy to focus on my new else. listening diet, everybody for just ten ninety nine, <laughs> you can learn how to lose weight. Just listening to my voice. Imagine. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's not going to work very well. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, uh, so w at, at the times when you're not able to listen, if you truly are exhausted and not able to give some of your full attention, mm. I give you permission to say, I'm having struggle focusing right now. Can we put a pin in this? Can we come back to this? Um, it's a good line. On the other hand, really good listening is efficient. When you are focused on what someone is saying, if you can give them your full attention and really hear it and understand it, and you can help yourself doing that by constantly going in your background and saying, what do they mean by that? What does that mean? That's interesting. Da -da -da -da. If you're asking yourself questions about what they're saying, it'll help you retain your focus. You can communicate so much more quickly. And this is biological, right? Like they have in, in Japan, they've installed in some of their planes uh, an instrument that just by listening to a pilot's voice can tell long before the pilot feels fatigued can tell that they're getting tired. There are indicators in our voices that communicate in a way that can't be tracked, that we can't fully understand. Have you ever um, uh, called a friend and they said hello and you went, what's wrong? Yeah. Right. right? That's an incredible amount of sophisticated information that you've just picked up in two syllables. Although I usually text people now and say, Hey, can you talk? And then they gather themselves. <laughs> like how often do I cold, just cold call people, but it's a great, <laughs> great point. Yeah. So with, when you are actually paying attention, when your, your attention is not divided with your cell phone or distracted by the computer right. that's sitting in front of you, it's a very efficient communication tool that we have. You have a lot about uh, multitasking, too, and how it's just it's really not helpful. Bad. It's really bad. And I, I love people be like, I'm great at multitasking. Nope. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> so here's what I do. when people say that I say, OK, turn to the person next to you yeah. and um, give them the directions to your house from the nearest big city. And at the same time, write down the alphabet. Ah, do those two things no together. Way. There, no. Yeah. Oh, it gave me no. anxiety even thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, listen, I'll let you go. I love talking. I hope we can do it again soon. And I'm so psyched to reconnect with you. But I, I final compliment for you. You're one of the people and I'm such a snob about media and interviews uh, because I'm in it and I do it that and I talk about specific people like this, usually off the air because I don't want to badmouth them. But you're one of the people who I'm as interested hearing her answers as I am hearing her questions. You're, and I think 
th- and I'll give you the last word on this, obviously. I think that ha- is driven by, and I try to model this myself, by your curiosity. Like you're genuinely curious when you're asking questions and you're looking up and getting the answers and then, you know, writing them for books like yours. But you're mostly asking questions to people, I think, much of your career interviewing people. And now you're giving answers as well. And I just don't think there's many people who are who are good at both. I think you're great at both. What What is that? Do you think is it the curi- intellectual curiosity? What is that quality that makes you good at both? Yeah. I think so. I mean, I, I am a genuinely curious person, but that's partly because I really, th- when people say things, I really think, what does that mean? Mm. Right? Like people will say stuff, they'll throw off a remark and I'll be like, wait a second, if that's true, then what? Um, and I think that sometimes we just sort of let it go by like CNN at the airport. It's just sort of like what people are saying is kind of our background noise and we're not really absorbing it. When you really listen to things that people say, you too will have a lot of questions. <laughs> you will have a lot of questions. I sometimes put Will Wolf Blitzer on in the background while I'm home just to relax and know not everybody has a wide range of emotions. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm genuinely curious in, in learning about people. People are freaky and weird and amazing and surprising Everybody has these weird quirks and, you know, it's juicy. (laughs) I like to find out about them. Uh, We need to talk how to have conversations that matter and do nothing. How to break away from overworking. I have the very fine print. I'm trying to read the uh, subtitle overdoing and under living. Both of these books have enriched my life, as has this conversation. Thank you so much for joining me today, Celeste. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's good to join you, and it's good to join someone who's done their homework. Oh, good. I'm glad you feel that way, because I definitely didn't feel like I'd done enough. Thank you. (laughs) There she goes, Celeste Headley. I hope that you enjoyed that conversation. I got so much out of both those books. I want to have more conversations like that one in the weeks and months to come. We don't have to focus each and every day on the absolute insanity coming out of the leader of our nation. It gives us a little bit more time and space to get not back to normal, but back to having conversations that cover a little bit more of a wider range of issues and topics. So I'm really excited to have had Celeste Headley on today's show. Please let her know that you heard her here on Twitter at Celeste Headley, CelesteHeadley.com. Get her books, watch her TED Talks. Coming up this week still, I'm going to have Judy Gold, Ruth Ben-Giat, who's got a new book out called Strong Men. Also, Dr. Eddie Gloud Jr. and Matt Iglesias, just to name a few, all coming up later on this week. And if you could support me if you aren't already with a paid subscription, that would be a huge thing. And I would be very Thanksgiving for that. Very grateful to all of you here on this Thanksgiving week. Sign up now for a paid subscription. Go to patreon.com slash Pete Dominic or go to the paid subscription link in any day's show notes. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. And I'm on your lawn right now. Look outside. I'm on your lawn, on your car. I don't know what's wrong with me. The show's over. Goodbye. I love you. Stay connected and join us on the Discord platform if you're a Patreon subscriber. See you there. 